Anna, we are good to go. We can start. Okay. Um, I remember my mother told me a story, a story about her and her grandmother. When she was younger, her grandmother wouldn't let my mother touch the achar or go into the temple when she was menstruating. She came from an educated family, yet she had to face such norms. However, my nani was there to make sure my mother didn't have to follow these norms and educated her about menstruation and the myths. Namaste, everyone. My name is Ahana Bharatram, and I'm a grade nine student in the Sri Ram School. About six, six months ago, I was researching for a school project and came across the data from an article in the print that only 20% of the women in India wear sanitary pads. My friend Anshi Agarwal and I were talking and I happened to bring this up with her. We were both shocked and felt the need to do something about this. Um, that's when we started talking to our parents about how we could contribute towards this larger issue on, um, on top and that um, we start talking to random women from a low income background. And we found out that it wasn't just menstruation, but also menopause, which was a taboo to talk about and be dealt with. Our project, our project spot on and off emanated from that. And we aim to raise awareness, break taboos and empower women to embrace menstruation and menopause as something very natural in their life. In early December, we went to two villages in Mewad, uh, which is in Haryana, to educate and interact with a total of 100 women and um, about menstruation. We showed them a video where two gynecologists emphasized on the importance of wearing a pad about, uh, about menstruation and the taboos associated with it. Um, we gave we gave a total of uh, 1,200 reusable pads, which last a year and are extremely hygienic. We also gave 400 uh, uh, disposable pads, which are biodegradable. Today, we have Sinu, uh, Sinu Ji, who is the co-founder and managing trustee of Mithri Speaks Trust. She has done extensive um, research in the areas of menstrual and reproductive health since 2009. She uh, traveled across rural India, interacting with thousands of adolescent girls and women uh, directly to get a first-hand experience of menstrual practices and the impact on women's health. Um, she foc um, her work has explored um, nat uh, native methods, cultural practices around menstruation and the science behind it. She has written extensive, uh, extensively on unearthing uh, the science behind uh, native practices and bringing forth a unique narrative. And we also have Dr. Neeta Dabhai, who is an obstetrician, gynecologist, and senior, cl uh, senior clinical researcher. She has over 23 years of clinical practice. She's presently working on a research project uh, on maternal health with the government of India and WHO, and also a master trainer for adolescent health with WHO for the last 14 years, and runs an ado adolescent health clinic as well as an adolescent health NGO at Faridabad. Now, based on the story, I told you about my mother. Um, Sinuji, um, Sinuji uh, do you feel it's similar in other educated households or is it just a hush-hush topic which isn't that common? Okay. So firstly, thank you, Anna, for joining us. It's really sweet and very nice to have uh, someone like you be part of this discussion. I'm very glad you could make it. I'm also glad that there is someone with so knowledgeable and with such a vast area of experience in the subject like Dr. Neeta. So Anna, I will uh, come straight first to the points that you mentioned, which were your reasons for entering this field, okay? So you said that you researched and you found that only 20% girls were using sanitary napkins, right? So that particular figure, if you dig a little deeper, you will find that it is not a published study, okay? So like you, I had also come across that number and uh, I contacted some menstrual researchers, many of whom were part of international organizations like the Society for Menstrual Cycle Research, and I told them to help me find the source of this number. You know why I asked them about this, why I had a doubt about this number? Because my field work, when I worked with the women in the villages, I realized that it is completely the opposite of what the rhetoric is being spoken. Okay, so uh, 
it's very natural that you feel that there is a problem according to the numbers and the data and the media representation. But I'd like to tell you that that is not the fact. Okay, so this 20 percent, only 20 percent women using sanitary napkins, this is a cooked up number because there is no published study. And you are free to look at it and look at research journals, look at websites that will help you get uh, research publications. You will not find this in existence. Okay, so this was a cooked up number. So the first thing is what is then the reality? What are the actual numbers that we can look at? So one of the reliable sources is the National Family Health Survey, NFHS. Okay, so this is a countrywide survey that is done every, I think, three years. And the latest data of NFHS that we have, which is 2015-16, it shows that as high as 48% of rural women are already using sanitary napkins. And if you look at both rural and urban, it is still much higher. Okay, so this is one thing. When we start working on an issue, the first instant that draws us into it is often an emotional one, as I'm sure it was for you also. But when you are there and when we start an organization and when we start voicing on behalf of others in our country, we have to do a lot more work to make sure that we are representing the correct picture. So let me tell you some facts that might surprise you, okay? The percentage of women in India who are actually having menstrual disorders, as in heavy menstrual bleeding, period pain, delayed period, all of these will come under menstrual disorders, okay? So the percentage of women in India who are facing these problems are only around 15 to 20%. And this is based on the gynecological studies. Gynecologists have done this, medical colleges have done this. But if you look at the number of women facing these problems in so-called developed countries, in England, the number is 52%. In France, in Spain, you take any of these countries, the number is definitely more than 30%. Yet we all have this mental block no? that they know much more than us, they are doing much more than us and we are the ones who are backward. So this is a false impression that has been created. It is not the reality, okay? So this is the first thing that I would like to share with you. It's wonderful that you have started on this work, but when you are voicing the women of this country, you have to be really sure that you are putting forth what is based on published research, those numbers, okay? Now, your question, is this a hush-hush topic or do people talk about it openly, right? That's a very nice question. Now, I will present to you three scenarios, which is pretty much three sections of our Indian society, okay? So the first section are those where the children and their parents are completely cut off from the Bharatiya perspective, okay? So in such a scenario, it is very natural for you to think that anything that is the cultural practice is a taboo, is a superstition, because you and your influencers talk that, you assume that there is nothing of sense in anything that is cultural. So you will think not going to the temple during the period is a taboo. You will think not touching the tulsi plant is actually a restriction. It is a means of suppressing women. So this is a very natural perspective that comes in because your means of education has only been the Western perspective, okay? Now there is a second section of society where the parents have been brought up with the traditional values. So the parents follow these things, they want to do it, but their children go to English speaking Western education systems. So then what happens? At, in school, the teachers tell the children, all this is superstition, but they go back home and their mothers and their grandmothers are telling them, don't do this, this is our culture. So then there will be a rift between the parent and the child. And children will start to think that my parents are backward. They do all these things because, you know, it's just culture. There's no meaning to it. And then there will be a divide. Then there is the third category, the third section, where fortunately, the parents have no influence of the Western system 
and they have only learned from the culture. These are mostly the women you think of as backward. These will be those who are daily wage workers, farm laborers, women who are living in the rural areas. And their children will be studying in government schools where even though the teachers are and the education system is largely what the British left us, still there is some understanding of the culture. Now, in these three sections, let us talk about openness in talking of menstruation, okay? The first section of society that I told you about, where everyone blindly dismisses anything that has anything to do with culture. So here we assume that we talk very openly, but what is our understanding of menstruation? It is something that is there for childbirth. So when I talk to older boys or men from this section of society, for them menstruation means knowing that the girl is not pregnant. <laughs> so that's an indication. In some ways, that is the method of safe sex. And when we start to talk to boys about menstruation, that is the only association they will make. Whether you call this openness or not, we will leave for another day, but this is how it is. Now the second section where there is half understanding and half dismissal, there most often the boys don't know much about menstruation and they only find out much later in their life, perhaps after marriage, and they're confused because their mothers said, follow the tradition, their wives are too modern and saying, no, that's nonsense, okay? so. They don't know whether to talk about it or not. So it's again half here and there. And finally, the third section, the rural people. Here, especially in South India, when the girl gets the first period, this boy was part of the celebration. No one gave him menstrual education, okay? He was just invited to the function because the whole village was invited. The men in the village were invited to the function. Then in this boy's home, when his mother or his sister got the period, very naturally, he had to help with the cooking and the cleaning and the household chores. Okay, very naturally he understood, okay, my mother has a period today, she has to take rest. Or my mother cannot cook sambar today, he will go to the neighbor auntie's house and say, auntie, give me some sambar, my mother has her period. He is not consciously trying to be open about it. It is very naturally in his ecosystem that menstruation is but a natural part and parcel of life. Very naturally, he thinks that when my mother or my sister menstruates, they deserve to take rest and I will help in the cooking and the cleaning. Now, is that the open-mindedness that we want to reach or is it just this biological understanding of menstruation related to sexuality and childbirth? So this understanding is something we all need to ponder about. When we say we need to talk about menstruation, who is not talking about it? And if someone does need to talk, what should they talk about it? If we remove the cultural context where the men had an active role to play when women in their lives menstruated, what will we reduce it to? Is that a healthy reduction? Is that what we want? These are things we need to ponder about. Uh, Dr. Neeta, would you like to add anything to that? Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, Ahana uh, and Sinuji, uh, once uh, we start talking about menstruation for a, for a gynecologist, for a doctor, the menstrual cycle is like a barometer of her health, you know. So, uh, talking about it or uh, comes very natural to us. You know, the first thing we'd ask any woman is about this. And uh, like you said, Sinuji, that there are three sections of society and uh, uh, they, they, uh, they, they have a very different attitude and they have a very different perception of uh, menstrual cycle. So uh, for me, it is very simple and very easy to talk about it. And it's a very important thing. So when I get a, a girl from, uh, say, a village, I mean, if I go to a and talk about it, uh, she will be shy to talk to me, but she will talk, her mother will talk, and obviously the, the husband will stand outside, but he is there with her. And uh, you have this middle section of people who 
five, say that it's an absolutely hush hush thing, you know, okay, so if the father has come here and say, I'm going to send the mother or I will send my daughter with a sister or somebody because I will not talk about it. He doesn't think it is necessary for him to talk because there is a doctor to talk about it. There is a, there's a female at home to uh, handle this. And then there are these so-called, uh, uh, so-called the new generation or the new section of society who thinks that menstruation is something we need to conquer. You know, they have this bravado that um, it's the last bastion. I mean, why the hell do we have menstruation? And uh, let's put it all behind us and we should, do, we should be able to do everything. Everybody is trying to break down those barriers, the so-called barriers in their minds, which they feel are inflicted by menstruation. Whereas for us, it's an absolutely normal thing. It's like, I would say it's a barometer of a woman's health. If her menstrual cycle is going on fine, we know that she is doing fine. Her, her system is working very well. So I see this and, uh, 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 you know, Ahana, girls come and say that uh, young girls like you, uh, when they are brought to my clinic, they say that, oh, you know, what a problem I have. I mean, like, why the hell do I have this? Because they have been taught that there is no difference between a man and a woman. Everything what a guy, what a, what a boy does or what, a man, or what man, a man does should be done by a woman. They do not realize the sanctity of menstruation. And I must say, Siruji, that uh, this book of yours has put everything in perspective. This is so beautiful. Um, and uh, before we go ahead, I would like to just read this line. I mean, I cannot help it. I must read this uh, quote. I'm, I'm quoting your quote to you. Thank and, you. <laughs> uh, and uh, you say that, um, so we have this modern medicine and we have all uh, the uh, uh, all the work imbibed from the, uh, from the West. But uh, before we go ahead, I want to tell everybody who is listening that um, this is a very opportune time to have to read this book and, it, and uh, having this book come out to us uh, where we are all reflecting. And uh, this reflection is about what uh, India is to us and what religion is to us and how, it, how important a role it plays. So uh, religion was considered by our ancient uh, uh, ancestors and our, uh, that uh, religion was considered as an effective tool to imbibe scientific understanding among the masses and rituals and religious practices evolved in this background. Has it been misused? That's what Siduji says. Perhaps yes, but calling all of it a superstition is actually a new level of superstition since it comes without the curiosity and exploration that religion might have wanted us to cultivate. This is so beautiful and it puts into perspective all what we have been relegating a menstrual cycle to myths, misconceptions. And uh, to be very honest, I have also been enlightened and uh, I have looked at this with a very new perspective and uh, things have been very much explained to me, Ahana. So I feel that if this is something, this is something which could be at your stage, uh, for a girl of her age, Sinuji, if this uh, is told to her and not only to her, to everybody that, you know, be proud, be happy and um, uh, uh, that you are, you, uh, and respect the menstrual cycle actually. So um, I would say that uh, it is, uh, it's actually a wonderful thing. And um, we, we all need to, uh, reflect on it very respectively, very, very, with respect, very, very respectful attitude rather than dismiss it as one of the body's uh, functions and physiology and uh, do nothing about it and learn more about the cultural practices. Um, so in school, we have growing up workshops where the girl learns about her periods. And so do you think it's necessary for us to learn about the past of menstruation, how it, hap uh, how it happens, we learn, but the myths, etc. Do you think it's important for us to learn about that? I think it's very important for you to learn about that. Very important to know what it is all about, um, especially the part, you know, when uh, girls say, and I think Siduji will agree with me when they say that, you know, this, uh, they have, they call it the dirty blood. 
ganda khoon you know it's inside me and it has to come out and uh when i hear something like that i say i have spent all my life you know handling women like that and i tell them that why is it called the ganda khoon so it's important for you to realize what this so i feel yes anatomically physiologically you must know this is not bad blood and this is what uh, nurtures the nurtures life actually it's perhaps the most perhaps the most precious tissue in this whole world in the cosmos actually which nurtures uh, young life so it's not a dirty uh, thing so you it's very important to learn about the myths uh, the so called myths which have been completely you know actually been totally busted by this wonderful book which uh, sidhu ji has written and i'd like to uh, 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 i'd like you to ask her about the some of the common myths and misconceptions which have been going around uh, 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 everywhere in fact and when they, when people ask us as doctors we say okay if you are we used to say that actually sidhu ji i have to be honest i used to tell them that uh, you know so if somebody is asking you not to go into temples please don't you know just respect that but why we never we never explored that and i don't think uh, our parents or my grandmother or my nani knew really the reason behind it all this was not told to us and when we when we run when you read this book you are um, you are actually looking at the wisdom of the Uh, religious practice or so called cultural practice and you realize that it is absolutely true scientifically thank you dr neeta ana i will also try and add to what dr neeta has just said see first of all when we call them myth we call them taboo we call them restriction we are starting with the mental block that it is something bad okay but uh, what do we do this is the language that has been given to us but you know in our native languages we don't have these words we don't have the word taboo uh, for example in uh, kannada karnataka where i come from in kannada we say sutaka which simply means a period of rest where this woman should be given special treatment we don't call it taboo and we don't look at it in a negative way okay like that i'm sure all indian languages had an equivalent word for these practices in ayurved we call it as rajaswala paricharya which simply means regimen to be followed a set of do's and don'ts which will take care of a woman's health so they were not myths they became myths because we lost the meaning behind these things so should you be taught this in your school absolutely yes but the question is who will teach <laughs> right see my own struggle why i took 10 years to write this book is because there was no one who could teach but does this mean the women were following it blindly no see there's this question which i struggle to understand ana and this see the first 5 years when like you i used to go and do sessions on menstrual hygiene girls used to girls of your age would ask me why can't we eat papaya during our period why can't we uh, you know have curd or anything sour why are we told not to exercise why should we not go to the temple so these were the questions that girls would ask me and initially first few years i said no no it's superstition there's nothing like this because uh, dr nita i was trained by a gynecologist to go and do these talks <laughs> so one of the best gynecologists and she told me all these things and i was also very confident with my education in you know the current education so i would tell the children no it's all superstition and then they would ask but why does my mother and grandmother say that we should do this and at some point you know i stepped out of karnataka i traveled to other states i covered four states in northeast india i worked in bihar in jharkhand in tamil nadu i just wanted to see is this the case across india or is this you know one or two the few women that i am meeting in karnataka so i personally spoke to more than 25 30000 adolescent girls and women across india and at some point it really hit me how can it be that millions of women in this country for hundreds of years have been preserving these practices if it is mere superstition this is a question we must all ponder about there have been so many outsiders in this country we've been invaded we've been colonized and through all that our grandmothers 
were they eccentric to hold on to these practices if there is no science no meaning in this why did they do it it is not enough to say that it was just faith or tradition because our mothers and grandmothers were not so foolish so why did they hold on to it that is because they experienced the positive effect of following it now they may not have had the language to communicate and express how it is helping them but they knew it through their experience let me give you one example so there's one village in karnataka where i was doing a workshop and the women suddenly told me that in their village every time a girl gets her first period she is given a potted plant and she has to nurture that plant for the duration of her period okay so she has to water it take care of it after that the women keep observing the plant all the elderly women in the village will observe the plant and they'll observe the girl if that plant withers away after a few days or weeks then the rule of not touching tulsi plant and other plants will apply to that girl but if that plant survives and nothing happens to it the rule does not apply to that girl see they were observing and seeing how girls interact with plants how the plant is affected by that presence and today i know and i have written in this book how ayurveda can explain it we have the concept of prakriti that means each of our body constitution is different so someone like me you know i am of a pitta prakriti that means that the uh, the element of agni of fire is very high in me and menstruation is a time when pitta is naturally high in you so the naturally high state of pitta plus my prakriti of pitta combined <laughs> i am too much for that sensitive tulsi plant the tulsi plant has never grown in my balcony it has always struggled but i have a friend she is a kapha prakriti kapha has the elements of water and earth so it is a calming personality so even during menstruation if she interacts or waters the tulsi plant it does not have the same effect this is just one example like this our grandmothers have seen how during menstruation when women go to the temple how their periods are affected they have seen that they have experienced it they so, may not have had to to press it so sir yes. this can i just interrupt so when you talk about this whole thing about this concept of uh, some women going to temples and how it suits some and it doesn't so now there is this whole concept about the uh, the idea that a girl who is menstruating is impure you know so don't touch this and don't touch that so uh, i think the everything has stemmed from the fact that the girl is or the woman is um, made to feel stigmatized okay i'm having my period so i can't go out i can't do this i can't do that uh, of course there are there are uh, you know as you explained there are reasons for it but this concept of purity is something which i'd like you to elaborate a little more upon uh, about is she really the one who is impure or is it something else i mean i, I want if you could talk a little about this so you know uh, that would be really nice sure so first of all uh, one background i want a uh, disclaimer of sorts that even to understand the most simple practice we need to have so many of our indian sciences as a background okay so what i was just talking to you as the basis in ayurveda we need to understand prakriti we need to understand dosha how did ayurveda understand menstruation okay if you're talking about temples yes we need the knowledge of ayurveda but we also need the knowledge of tantra and chakras that is another shastra itself so the difficulty and why we are not able to just communicate it like that is because all those who are listening should have this fundamental knowledge otherwise i will end up in explaining first what is ayurveda what is dosha and so on so this is the first thing so if those of you who are listening to this feel that this information is too new or incomplete it's because of course you do not know the indian knowledge systems and it will of course sound very new and that is why take what i'm saying as a portion of the knowledge if this interests you then read the book which provides more elaborate information okay so having said that the question of 
impurity because that's given as the blanket reason for anything and everything anything and every restriction whereas it is definitely not the case absolutely now, now but how did this idea of impurity come into being okay if we understand how that happened we will have a clearer picture of what the indian ancestors the indian sciences meant by impurity itself okay now in ayurveda if you see the understanding of menstruation is as a process that detoxes your body that cleanses your body yeah in modern medicine and gynecology it is a process necessary for you to have a child okay but in ayurveda they don't talk about it like that they talk about it as something that cleanses the female body cleanses it of what so ayurveda tells you that the food that does not digest completely say for example you're eating fruits it will digest in a much faster time correct but if you eat pizza with a lot of cheese on it the cheese takes what 72 hours no to break down and digest so if you eat non veg it takes even longer so like this if humans consume food that is difficult to digest a portion of this food will remain undigested and rot in your intestine this rotting will produce something a toxin which ayurveda calls as ama a m a ama okay and if there is excess ama you will face all kinds of menstrual problems your stomach cramps are nothing but the gastric issues caused by excess ama some girls who are vomiting it out it is nothing but your body trying to cleanse your upper digestive tract because there is so much ama there when you have acne and pimples on your skin it is your skin trying to detoxify during your period when you have loose bowel movements it is that that intestinal tract that is trying to cleanse out so all your menstrual pains and difficulties are because and are directly related to how much ama you have so the spirit that we are cursing is actually doing us a favor by giving you a natural detox for which otherwise you have to pay and do it like a therapy <laughs> okay now why is it doing this detox because as women as women your body should be capable of creating a new life and a new life will struggle to be born if there is a lot of ama so most of the fertility problems ayurveda understands that as too much ama when ama is excess it affects all your dhatus dhatu is what ayurveda calls the tissue layers and your seventh your last tissue layer is your shukra dhatu that is your reproductive system if ama is excess it percolates right up to your reproductive system and you have infertility so one of the treatments for infertility is panchakarma what do they do in panchakarma they make you vomit they make you you know they remove the excess ama from by by urination by defecation by sweating through your nasal thing which is nothing but the problems you go through when you menstruate <laughs> so if you observe the panchakarma therapy and the way it is pushing ama out of you it is a similar thing that happens every time you menstruate if you have excess ama so this impurity 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 that the idea where it came from is because our ancestors understood when you menstruate this impurity called ama is being pushed out of your body now when we don't understand it fully what we thought menstrual blood is impure but the impurity is not coming out to the menstrual blood absolutely itself. it is through yes. the of acne or vomiting or loose bowel movements or gastric issues that is how the ama is being pushed out but if you are in a state where there is excess ama then there will be discoloration in the blood also now you know how we all fret about staining no all these whisper and stay free ads are we go mad if you stain you must never have a stain you know what ayurveda says if you have a stain observe the stain So put a drop of the menstrual blood on a cotton cloth and pour normal room temperature water over it if it washes away without leaving a mark that means you're healthy that means there's no ama but if the menstrual blood does not wash away fully and it leaves behind a yellowish mark a stain that is an indication of ama 
so this much knowledge was contained in a simple thing which we simplified and said okay you are impure <laughs> so that is not completely wrong but the way we understood it and the way we oversimplified it as a reason for every practice that is wrong so you see there are so many levels of understanding such a simple thing no and the concept of ama itself is so deep what causes ama what are the types of ama how it is eliminated all that is a very elaborate uh, subject in itself okay but this is just one glimpse to let you know how deep the subject is and how we cannot generalize it i hope i answered both your questions yes over to you ahana So, how, uh, Sinu Ji, how do you take on the Western perspective, which is the one uh, shown in schools and the media, which is uh, promoting sanitary pad industries and medicine? So now you're getting it, Anna. You've asked the right question. <laughs> so I'm wonderful that you're asking the question because I think then my job is done. <laughs> uh, it needs to be through you. It needs to be the youngsters of this country. who are curious about our own heritage our own culture and we dig deeper i'll tell you why for me this session is so important and so special one because you are here and you are asking such important questions because beyond my life span beyond my time it will be you and your friends who will take this forward okay forget about the big organizations who are pushing sanitary napkins they can't do a thing if we build our strength from within and what is our strength from within that is you that is your generation and the other reason why i'm so happy being here is because there is someone a gynecologist someone who's from the background of modern research who is so open to understanding our culture her own culture that is a ra rarity and that is precious and if both of you exist i feel my job is done <laughs> the rest will happen and i'm not worried about the big companies or the corporates but it's important for me that ordinary women and doctors from this country regardless of what branch of medicine they have studied they begin to ask these questions and delve deeper into our own native sciences that is our collective responsibility and if we did that then there is nothing else uh, to be done the rest will happen if not in my lifetime maybe in yours <laughs> so uh, just to add to that uh, sidhuji uh, uh, let me tell you something that you know uh, i think uh, there are a lot of people who would be open to it and even in my fraternity i would feel and perhaps uh, uh, over the last uh, couple of year or even just the last one year there has been so much of interest in this uh, uh, field of ancient uh, wisdom but besides that there has been one place where we all have struggled you know where uh, we don't know what to offer uh, to a young girl or a woman who is beset with all these problems and uh, we always gave them something called lifestyle modification okay and without really understanding so that lifestyle modification was perhaps uh, diet and exercise is i think with the uh, with most of our listeners who are listening um, we all know that this is what a diet doctor would prescribe with lifestyle modification would mean diet and exercise but it go it went beyond that and when i start we started exploring mental health we decided that no okay so diet exercise and be happy right i think there is another dimension to this and that is your religious wisdom so if i so tomorrow if i have a girl and i and she comes to me i need to tell her that simply dieting and exercising is just not going to help so lifestyle modification needs to uh, expand and uh, imbibe all what is uh, in our religious wisdom and um, once we start respecting this whole process and we start understanding this whole process i think our life would be easier uh, and uh, most concerning is that the fact that the menstrual disorders are uh, actually on the rise and when i say menstrual disorders it's simply not having heavy periods or having um, painful periods it's beyond that it's it's the polycystic ovary ovarian problem which we are talking about is the hormonal imbalance which we are talking about and we are seeing it um, hugely 
Uh, and just to give you an example about how huge the problem is that polycystic ovaries, when I was a student and a, uh, a final year student of MBBS, uh, polycystic ovaries was uh, one chapter in my book relegated and we would say, oh, isme se question kabhi nahi aata hai. let's not even look at this chapter. And today, if I, in my clinic, if I see seven girls or 10 girls, six will have either uh, issues with PCOS or they think they have issues with PCOS. They, a lot of it is also imagined and they come to you saying that I've got this problem. So the spectrum of uh, problems emanating from menstruation are huge and they are on the rise. And we are all wondering how to get about it. You give more and more medication, but that's not it. We got to go back to our roots and everybody, this book is fantastic. You have to read it. Everybody needs to read it. And uh, yes, rightly, uh, uh, initially, when we like you, Synergy, uh, my, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I was curious because of the Sabri Mala confusion. I wondered why was this whole confusion about and we started reading and I read your first book and I read this book and I read some couple of more books. I went into all what you've talked about and I think that it's very important that each one of us listening here today uh, delve into uh, deeply into this uh, aspect and start looking at your grandmothers and mothers and everybody with a different eye, you know, they are doing something which is very right. Yes, uh, I'd like to ask Siduji, you know, that's what, what is one thing which you would like to tell our listeners, our young girls, ladies, women, menopausal, premenopausal, what is the one thing which they could do on a daily basis to uh, kind of, you know, uh, imbibe even a little bit of what you have talked about in this book and which would help them? So I will tell you, that's such a wonderful question and... Uh because I do have an answer. So when I have an answer, the question is always wonderful. <laughs> so I tell you, uh, this is a new year, new year resolution that I also made. And I will tell you what is that simplest of things that all of us can do on a daily basis. And that will have an unimaginable positive impact on our physical and mental well-being. And that is simply visiting a temple, perhaps a Devi temple, every day, first thing in the morning. Now, when I say a temple, obviously we are thinking that, oh, such a religious thing. We are talking about, you know, being faithful and all that. If you are faithful, if you have bhakti, that's great. That's fantastic. But from what I have understood of temples, these were our ancestors' wellness centers. What we have today as health clinics, the original ones were the Hindu temples because the way in which they were built, there is a technique called prana pratishtha by virtue of which a certain life energy is put into that space and into the vigraham and anyone who comes in contact with that will experience a positive cycle, physiological impact. Uh, just to give you a couple of examples where very obviously women especially can experience this. You have Devi temples which are known for fertility, right? So women have go there on Tuesdays and Fridays. And in Kerala, there is one such temple. It is the Chengannur Bhagavati temple where they believe that Devi menstruates. One of the meanings of that is anyone who has a menstrual or reproductive difficulty, if they go to that Devi temple, then it fixes their menstrual cycle. Now, obviously we will wonder why, and there is an explanation to that in this book. I will not go into that why, but I want you to know that this understanding does not come from theory or legends or some story. You go and ask any devotee there, ask her why she is there. And she will tell you of a time when she had a menstrual problem and how visiting that temple fixed it. I have been to that temple and I have observed how it shifted my menstrual cycle and delayed it by 13 days, which I was surprised of. But when it did come, it actually came in sync with the moon cycles. And that is another concept, I'll not get into it. But just so you know, 
as women, we are not entities that are cut off from the universe. We are very much part of the cosmos. And in, in the Hindu tradition, women were considered as embodying Prakriti itself. So nature cycles reflect in a woman's cycles. So the cycles of the sun, the solstices, the cycles of the moon, the new moon and the full moon, they reflect in your menstrual cycle. And when your menstrual cycle is not healthy, you'll be completely out of sync with these. So there are these temples like this Bhagwati temple in Kerala. There is the Kamakya Devi temple in Guwahati, Assam. And both these temples, when you visit there, you will notice how your period will shift. And that period which comes after that shift will be a lot more easier. These temples work on the lower chakras. We call it the Swadishthana and the Muladhara chakra. And these chakras in turn influence the endocrine glands in that region. In other words, it works on your reproductive organs, on your ovaries. Doctor was mentioning about PCOS becoming so common. So one of the things in PCOS is that your ovary is not able to keep up. It is not able to convert testosterone into the female hormone because the Swadishthana chakra is weak. So going to these temples will bring in more prana. So let's not use loose terms like energy and all that. The actual word is prana. It brings in more prana to your Swadishthana chakra, which in turn will further push that prana towards your reproductive organs, which are then becoming functional if they were dysfunctional. So many women have experienced this. Now, you know why our grandmothers never complained of PCOS and endometriosis and all of that simple thing. Every day morning, they would wake up, take a bath, go to the nearest temple. And they had it, they wouldn't go to a temple. That's equally important. So the simple thing of visiting a Devi temple every day, your most of your health problems get taken care of. But we also need to know how to go there. If there are rules in that temple, like Shabri Mala or anything else, we must follow those rules. Because behind all those rules are deep sciences rooted in our Shastras. We may not all know the sciences. Of course, I've explained some of it here. But if there is a rule in that temple, never break it. Because breaking it will have an adverse impact on your own reproductive health. You're the own, there's no point to prove to others. Your own health will suffer. <laughs> right? So that's one thing that we can all do this year. And uh, so you talked about Devi temples and all that. So in a modern city, like for many listening here, they may not be able to go to temples. And uh, so that is, is there anything else which we could do? Uh, and you talked about the arm chanting in uh, your book. And... Uh, I just wanted to know that uh, since when you, when you do when you chant the arm chanting, it um, it actually uh, uh, vitalizes and uh, it uh, stimulates your chakras, your muladhara chakra and the swadeshana chakra. So, is that the, is, is that one practice which we which girls could do? And the only query I had was that you uh, that. Uh, Will this will this uh, practice of chanting be uh, also okay when you are menstruating, or it has to be done only when you are not menstruating? So the reason I don't recommend something like chanting is because you has you have to ideally be initiated for it, right? So even the Om chanting, if you chant O and M, mm, the sounds and the reverberations are from your higher regions, your higher right. chakras, not conducive for for women. So but you, you said about the arm chanting, the sound, yeah. You start with the R sound, it balances it. But even then, to get to a state where you can chant, before that, you should have done some amount of pranayama. So your breath is under control. Before the pranayama, you should have done the asanas so that your physical channels have been cleansed. Before the asanas, you should have followed the right diet. <laughs> okay, so a chant is not something that we should pick up like that. There is a lot of preparation we should do before we can chant 
And ideally, a chant or a mantra should be given to you as an initiation by a guru. So that's why I don't recommend that for all. If you are in that path and if you're doing it, see a lot of people when I talk of chakras, they ask me, okay, which chakra shall I trigger? Like it's some switch to be turned on and off. No, the yoga which talks about working on chakras, the kundalini yoga or laya yoga, that lays down rules to be done before you even start thinking about chakras. You have to do the deha shuddhi, the body cleansing. You have to do your buddhi shuddhi. You have to do the prana shuddhi. You have to do all those things. There are five such shuddhis which you have to do before you can even begin on the path of laya yoga or kundalini yoga. So those are complex things. It has become too common now because we have ashrams and gurus. But even then, if you're going to the ashram and you picked it up from a guru, do it. Not because you read it in a book. <laughs> okay, so the thing that is available for all of us without too much preparation, you just take bath, go on an empty stomach, is the temple. And everything that has to happen for you via a mantra happens in a temple. And it's so much easier. There's nothing you have to do. You just have to show up. <laughs> You just literally need to show up. And there is a Ganapati temple in every nook and corner. Ganapati or Ganesha is associated with the Muladhara chakra, your basic chakra to start off your life processes. So Ganapati chakra or Ganapati uh, temple is something you can visit or in your own homes, light a lamp. That is something you can do. But somewhere we all want to do the more complex things. <laughs> so the more complex it is, the more it is about uh, shabda, about words. Not only do we need practice so that our pronunciations are right, we need to be initiated. And there's so much preparation we have to do to ready ourselves to take that mantra and to recite it. So the simplest thing is a temple. But go on an empty stomach, go after a bath. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. So I think, uh, Ahana, we've got huge number of audience questions. And uh, uh, I think probably, I don't know, uh, Mohit, you'll have to tell us how much time do we have. We've got so many uh, questions. And I think we just leave it now for the audience to uh, post their questions. And uh, I think we one have thing to... we can say is that most of the questions are covered in detail in this book. So in a lot of ways, it doesn't make sense because I cannot elaborate on the questions and the information will seem, you know, a little cut off. But uh, if this interests you, then everything you need to know is there in the book. The book is ebook is available on Kindle. Uh, of course, the hard copies are also there. So that's something I would like to tell people in case we are not able to address your questions. I think we can take a few questions, some very interesting questions that bring out the new perspective. And uh, there are men who have asked the question. So I would uh, give a priority to the men first here, please. Sure. <laughs> Anna, would you like to take some questions now? Yeah. So um, there's also, we've addressed, you've um, said a message for the women. So do you have anything to say to the men who are currently watching um, this? That's so nice. And thank you for whoever asked that question. That's so thoughtful of you to even ask that question. So what I want to tell the men is that you have an active role to play in the lives of the women, maybe your sister, your mother, your wife, your girlfriend, there is a role for you to play. And that role is to take over from her when she has her period, allow her to rest help her in her household chores, learn cooking. You know why South Indian men cook well? <laughs> because when South Indian women, women from Southern states in India, when we have our period, we don't cook. They have to cook. <laughs> so even the small boys in the house, 11 and 12 year old boys know to cook because they give their mothers a rest. That is something which we've had in our culture and we've had it in North India also. We lost it for various reasons. I've touched upon that. But if you're a man who wants to do something meaningful, it is to allow the women in your life time off when they have their period. Take over their household chores and let them rest. That would be a wonderful thing that you can do for the women. Um, so um, we had talked about the Amma and how we cleanse, our, how would the women cleanse our system? What is the same for men? How do the men cleanse their system? Very important question. 
Uh, so that's the thing. Very, very nice question because when we ask these questions, we will understand the value of menstruation itself. Men do not have an equivalent process of natural detox. Okay, so so far, most of us feel sorry for women, know that they have their period. But when you know this, you'll actually feel sorry for men, <laughs> because for men to have the equivalent of a menstrual detox, they have to be very regular in their diet, their yoga, and their spiritual practices, so that their body can detox. If they don't do that, and your body will not show you signs like how your menstrual blood will show. If something slightly off in our period, then we know our overall health is affected, and that's when we go to the doctor. Men don't have these signals, so for most men, it will suddenly end up in a big disease. If you see the percentage of men who have heart problems, cholesterol problems, blood sugar problems, it is much more than women of that age. Women don't have it because our period protects us. The same period that we curse, it is actually protecting us. Absolutely. Women. This is lifestyle diseases for women start after menopause. After menopause, yes, you're very, very but, right. Absolutely. Yes. So, men, I'm sorry to say, but you have to do this detox for yourself because nature does has not given you that gift. So, what that detox for men means: be very careful with your diet, go off addictive substances because the tendency for men see the estrogen and testosterone cycle works very differently. Estrogen has this very steady increase through the month, and it you know it makes us go in this way. Whereas testosterone will have your daily ups and downs. And if you are not on a spiritual path, and if you are not using something like yoga that will help you to testosterone levels, you basically become addicted to substances. So the different substances that men have, they give you those artificial peaks of testosterone of energy. To avoid that and to detox yourself. In India, we have the wonderful system of yoga. That is why there's so much sadhana for men. For women, they don't have so many. You have to do the sandhya vandanam and all of those things because we have a period once a month. Everything is taken care of. But men, on a daily basis, you have to be doing all of those things to have the equal effect of a period. So, very important question, and I think uh, I hope the men reflect on this more. <laughs> so, I think that's beautiful. I mean the. You have put you have put women on a pedestal, and uh, I'm very delighted to hear that. That's absolutely wonderful. I mean, and that's such a wonderful and a beautiful way of looking at menstruation. So, um, what, uh, Sinuji, what was the inspiration and what was the purpose of this book, and who is it directed to? Which sector of society is it directed to? So the inspiration, Anna, is you and the many girls like you that I have worked with. Okay, so there's nothing else. Every time I talk to young girls of this country, when they ask this question, "Why should I not go to the temple? Am I so impure?" That is the only reason why I went after these questions. Okay, so purpose and the the who I want to address is you, is your generation, and uh, it's it and it's it's. A bonus that someone like Dr. Nita also comes on board and joins hands. That's a wonderful thing to happen. But this book is for any woman, any girl who has had this question: What? Why do we do these cultural practices? Is there anything to it? Anyone who wants to know it, it is for them. Um, uh, Dr. Nita, would you like to add anything to that? So I think uh, there are a couple of questions on menopause. So there are women who want to know that, uh, Siduji, what is what are your thoughts on menopause uh, on this? So there are two couple of questions on that. So uh, I will write about menopause when I get there in a few years. It's not too far. <laughs> I will get there. But I will tell you this: for all the wonders of menstruation that I talk about, uh, I look forward to menopause. not because menstruation is a problem but if you are even slightly spiritually inclined menopause is the time where you go to the next level spiritually okay so menopause during menstruation your body is something that can very easily pick up subtle aspects so when you go to a temple you can actually experience the chaitanyam there because menstruation makes you that sensitive okay when you reach menopause that experience comes a whole cycle now 
lot of people say that uh, you know in the west women continue to be very modern and date and marry even after menopause they use estrogen uh, synthetic estrogen to keep up their energy levels and so on but you see in india uh, once she reaches menopause she she has the jap mala and she sitting and in some temple that is so backward that's not backward just as menstruation has a purpose in your life menopause also has a purpose you know for men because they don't have these demarcations if they have to work towards moksha their whole life is a struggle they have to practice brahmacharya they have to do all that sadhana because nature has not given them these natural options so pursuit of moksha for men is so strict and full of rules for women you can have a fulfilling life of bhukti that is of worldly pleasures and after menopause the path of moksha just like that opens up for you so menopause is that it's that possibility of moksha wherein you are done with the life of bhukti and now you can also achieve mukti so a woman's body is not a hindrance in the spiritual path it is the very path itself whereas a man whether he is you know old or young or whatever for him brahmacharya is a must he has to follow that <laughs> and he has to do so many things for women the rules are much lesser and the spiritual path opens up for you and women should explore that possibility when you reach menopause don't keep looking back at your menstrual ages they were wonderful they were great but menopause is a new possibility a fantastic opening that will happen for you and you should welcome it as such and explore what it shows for you thank you so much so i think uh, we look forward to that uh, that book of yours because uh, there are uh, i mean everybody is so curious about that that you know when uh, uh, so and, and with this book it seems like it actually means you know it actually seems like menstruation is so blessed it's a fabulous beautiful phase of life uh, the reproductive phase and uh, uh, we really look forward to menopause and what you said about uh, <laughs> So, I look forward to it too. <laughs> so I think uh, we can take one last question, and then it's it's a pretty big one, but uh, I think uh, this is uh, important. So uh, this is from Australia, Niranjan, uh, who says that in one of your earlier talks, you talked about the need to holistically look at ancient in Indian wisdom to grasp the true meaning and share the same with others. we often hear of masters in one field say ayurveda tantra yoga agama shastra etc but encompassing multiple darshanas and combining it to make sense is altogether a different uh, elevation level of skill apart from being blessed with the devi's grace how does one go about holistically understanding teachings of our ancestors do you have recommendations on reading material uh, from various subjects so Some recommend. So wonderful question. Uh, there are. I'll tell you a couple of ways in which I went about it. There would be other ways of doing it, but uh, if you are a woman who is trying to understand it, the first learning tool that you have is your own body. Uh, there is no bigger book. There is no greater laboratory than your own body. If you start observing your body and its experiences, you will learn many things at a much quicker pace. uh men also write about menstruation talk about it but very often they get things wrong because without the experience of this subject you cannot possibly know it fully so your knowledge will be only theoretical we'll read books but that will give us a theory and perhaps help us validate some of our experiences but the first point of our learning if it comes from our experience of observing our body observing life around us and how we interact with that life then you will make big leaps very soon okay that's the first step then the second thing is when you have a question in mind so today we have a trend that if we have a question we'll ask sadguru or samata guru cuz why should we make all that effort they will answer for us you know when i started the, on this journey and i had this question that children had asked me why are women considered impure i also wrote to many gurus <laughs> uh, only one guru answered and that was also a very mystical answer but because 
I didn't easily get those answers. I went in search of it. So allow the questions to remain in your mind. Contemplate on it, think on it, argue and debate, not with others, with yourself. With social media, we have this tendency of the minute something comes to our mind and if we, are, we will first decide whether it's right or wrong. And then we will comment about it and we will comment about others and we will judge others. We are wasting our capacity, our thinking ability in that. If you have a question, keep it with you, mull over it, consider all the possibilities, twist and turn it, look at your experience, look at the other experiences. If you find one answer to that question and you get 10 other questions in the process, <laughs> then you haven't found that answer, continue looking. So this is the first thing, these are the first steps that you have to do. And after that comes reading. If you don't have a question in your mind, if you're not curious, if you're not searching, then every book you read will become a struggle. Or you will be reading it just to count and say, ah, I've read 10 books. <laughs> okay, I have read the Vedas, I have read the Tantra, I have read Agama. For what? So have a goal for your reading. I did not set out to read 10 different sciences. I set out in search of an answer to a question. That search took me to 10 different sciences and I didn't feel the effort. I enjoyed each thing because there was a question that was getting answered in the process. So don't start with books, start with a question. Build that question in yourself. Observe your, ex your surroundings, have your own experiences, contemplate on that. Spend a lot of time in contemplation. And then when you pick up a book and read it, you will understand much more than you would if you just read books and references, okay? Now, if it is menstruation, I have taken a certain path. But what I'm telling you is a general path for whatever question that you are trying to find answers to. For example, uh, recently I took up the review of standard sixth CBSE textbook, history book. Okay, and I read it. And one, uh, it's a very painful, toxic book because our children are taught all things negative about Hinduism. And one of the things that runs through the book time and again is this. Women and Shudra Varna were not allowed to study the Vedas. This is repeatedly told in different ways in this book. So this is the current question that is in my mind that I'm trying to understand, that I'm trying to contemplate. And you know where this questioning and this contemplation has led me to? It has led me to understand Bharatanatyam and Natya Shastra. <laughs> From where to where you will wonder. Yes. And I never planned that I will go there. But I'm right now there and uh, I will explore that more deeply and someday I will write and perhaps talk. So never have a set book that you're going to read. Because you don't know where you're going to find that answer. But keep that question in your mind and it will take you through the sciences, the darshanas, the shastras, all of that will happen. But the question is important. What is it that you're trying to do? Don't read books for the sake of becoming some scholar or to say that I have read all these books. It's pointless. Have a question. And that will take you very deep into so many books and without you feeling that pain or effort of doing it. And uh, you yourself mentioned that Devi's grace is a must. Absolutely. All forms of Vidya are nothing but the grace of Shakti, of Saraswati. If that grace is not upon us, there's nothing we can learn, nothing we can talk, nothing we can comprehend. That's a given. And uh, that's why Devi Temple. So more reasons than one. <laughs> more reasons than one. Yes. Uh, everything that has to happen for you happens through Devi. Yeah. So without her grace, we can't even imagine talking about this. I mean... You know, Dr. Nita, people told me that my book is going to meet with so much criticism uh, that uh, I will not be able to, you know, even come out in public. It will be criticized so much. But look at this. I've hardly received, I've received so much acceptance. And people told me, how are you going to market it? How are you going to sell it? My answer was simple. You see this painting on this book? Uh, the artist named this painting as Lakshmi. Okay. So the wow. cover... My book carries Lakshmi. The name is Rutu Vidya. Vidya is Saraswati. And my inner pages have Bhagwati and Kamakya Devi. Now, should I be marketing such a thing? It has no, its own. Need to. <laughs> it will go on its own and it's not me doing it. I'm very aware that 
the way this book is being received and this conversation that we are having i am just a channel for making this happen this is not my will <laughs> there's something much beyond me that is putting this seed in all of you in such a positive way so that is what we call saraswati that's who we call as shakti and if she happens for us then everything will be so easy all the questions that you're seeking they will come and stand in front of you <laughs> but you must have a question <laughs> that's your first thing no i think this book has come out at a very opportune time and it is ordained so uh, there's one uh, i know we are running out of time but i think i would like ahana to have the final word and uh, ahana i would like to know what is your take home message from this and uh, what do you think of it now i think it's um i used to take menstruation as something as like a a uh, pain once a month it's just uh, a horrible time of the month but i think i've looked deeper i've i've heard more about it and look at it more positively than before that's that's absolutely wonderful and i think so it's so nice you, <laughs> yeah. yeah so i i think if every girl starts looking at this uh, this way that yeah. like sinuji said that it's a time for uh, it's actually time for detox it's a time of your purification so uh, i think everything will be fine because once you start thinking right you will always have uh, no problem at all i think this Absolutely. is wonderful thanks Absolutely. ahana so thank, thank you ahana so that was lovely I'd like to thank City Book Leaders for organizing this event and Sinu Ji and Dr. Neeta for joining us and sharing their thoughts. Um, Anshi and I both are really grateful for this opportunity um, to moderate this session. So thank you and everyone who joined. Um. And uh, I'd especially like to thank uh, Mohit that uh, he just brought this into being. uh this was something so wonderful uh that he initiated and uh, uh thank you so much mohit from my side i mean i'm really Absolutely. grateful thank you thank you so much mohit ji i truly an honor dr neeta truly an honor sinu ji and uh, to ahana um i think i i really want to say thanks to all three of you and sinu ji gave the answer to it as well if you have the right question you arrive at the right book and uh, that's how uh, we both arrived at this book while we were doing our course on ancient wisdom and a lot of our batchmates are here as well uh, sinu ji that's how i think the nature has given answers to us and thank well, you ahana i'm glad i could uh, discuss with your mother and uh, get your opinion for your initiative which is spot on and off thank you and mohit we need to take this forward we need oh, to yes. have, we need to open uh, sinu ji for some intensive workshops and uh, <laughs> uh, i am like really itching to go ahead with this this is uh, a truly different way and like sinu ji said it's a different science you know and it and uh, perhaps somewhere that that scientist in me is like itching to explore new horizons and uh, to find an answer to so many things which we just have not been able to Absolutely I'll be very happy to come on board uh, Dr Neeta whenever you and Mohit ji decide that the time is right I'll be very happy to uh, <laughs> join in whatever way possible and, and I and there are there are still many questions I think from our audience which have been unanswered and Mohit you'll have to find a way to get these answered as well because I know we are running out of time but maybe we could do something and send them the well, answers uh, the book has a lot of the answers <laughs> so that's one thing <laughs> i think seriously i have a suggestion because i started with this book with a simple mm-hmm. question around the bruha of sabri mala and i yeah. think we should do a separate session on all the chakras and also yesterday as we were discussing how the chakras actually impact and aroma and everything around you in your life impacts we need a separate sure. session on chakras <laughs> yeah the chakras and the plexuses and everything i mean it's just sure. actually all fits into place it's like a it just is just like a jigsaw puzzle but everything fits wonderfully well <laughs> we i'll be happy to do it mohit ji and uh, whenever you and dr neeta feel that is right we will definitely plan uh, one or more workshops i'm not even keeping an up a limit to it no, i'll be happy i'm really happy by the time ahana will also read the book so i yeah. know <laughs> i know how to yes <laughs> fantastic i think uh, it's time to say good night to everyone and uh, yeah. thank you ahana yeah. a special thanks to you 
you have really inspired us and uh, um, this is this was for my daughter i must say this session was specially for my daughter for me to understand this subject and thanks anna for uh, playing this lovely role amongst all of us thank you very much thank you synergy thank you dr neeta everyone thank you so thank much you. thank you